Well, um, after that inspirational talk from Margaret and uh, the numerous examples of good practice that you're going to hear later today and have a chance to discuss, some of you with local roles will, I know, be going back to your teams uh, and particularly to your CCG, your Commissioning Group Executive meeting on Thursday morning, and you'll say, tear up the agenda, <coughs> health coaching for all. Now, I'm equally sure, however, that sitting around the table will be uh, other people who were saying, well, telehealth was last month's priority, and we know that the future is digital. Uh, what about care planning? I've heard that's good. Uh, well, our population won't want that. And, but, Practically, we've spent our money on the risk prediction tool for emergencies. And if there was an external observer, I think they might be saying, what about joining this up? And of course, that's the right thing because all of these things are important. It's just at the moment, we don't have a practical way to bring them all together. And some of you here have national roles and what we used to call regional roles. And there are tensions there and dilemmas uh, for you people. For instance, there's been strong government policy for over two administrations that having better care for long-term conditions and involving people in their care is important. And yet when people are asked, there has been no change in their reported involvement in decisions about their care over that time. Clinicians, when they're asked, believe that they support self-management, 80% of them do, but patients are certainly not so sure. When you ask about the pressure on staff, they say it's because tests and tasks are counted. And we know that patients are asked about their own goals less than 50% of the time. There are multiple projects, as that CCG group saw, to support self-management. Sorry, that's the, oh no, it's there. Support for self-management for people with long-term conditions, but few, if not any, joined up strategies. Our hope is in clinical leadership. But when we ask uh, GPs, 60% do not endorse patients as independent decision makers. And finally, there are specific skills training widely available, but it's simply not linked to people's job roles, and there's no quality assurance. So how about a delivery system? Now, up till now, there really hasn't been anything practical that people at the grassroots could use to link all these things together in their everyday life. Uh, but this is now changing, and there is something that could be used for this that is being discussed and talked about, and Penny has asked me to describe this to you so that you might have this in your mind as you're thinking about ways to get the, all these benefits of health coaching that you've heard actually get them to the right people in England. Now, this delivery system, it starts with a common approach, but it's all locally configurable. It involves, I'm afraid, change in routine care. It really is about culture change. It's not an add-on. It's built up from patient needs, international evidence, and grassroots UK experience and it links the things that need to be linked that we've heard about. It links support for self-management, clinical care, and service coordination and signposting when that's relevant for the person. And it ends with a unique solution tailored to each person. And remember, there's 15 million people with long-term conditions in England. So it starts with something, a common thing we could all do, and it ends up with that personalized solution. So let's start with that individual's perspective on which all this was built. Some of you may have seen this picture before. It, the green wavy line was drawn by people with long-term conditions on a paper tablecloth at a workshop. And they said, this is what it's like to live with a long-term condition. It has its ups and downs. And then those orange bars were, were drawn on, and those are the contacts people have with the NHS. And uh, as you can see, they uh, aren't very wide. They only last about three to five hours in a whole person's life. And the rest of the time, the 8,757 hours, they are managing the condition themselves. They are, in fact, self-managing for good or, or, or ill. And we know that less than 50% of the time in those orange bars is, is even mentions the fact that they will be doing this. The other thing that's important, of course, is that those bars are there at our convenience. Um, they bear no relationship to whether the person is up or down. 
So this um, uh, delivery system addresses both of those points. It addresses the orange bars, better use of NHS contact time, and it also um, provides the right support in the right place at the right time to support people living their daily lives. So let's translate that to the commissioning perspective and have an overview of this. And I want to start on uh, the uh, left side um, with the individual coming up and having a, what we're going to call a collaborative or personalized care planning encounter in which they talk through with the healthcare professional what is the important thing for them in terms of living their life as they find it at that moment. And if we take the first person there, maybe that's someone who would like some more information, what we call patient education. Um, maybe weight is an issue. They're really, really keen. That's their priority to lose weight, but they haven't in the past. And so perhaps referral to some health coaching sessions could really support them, and they would value this. The next person comes up is in, uh, under great social stress. They have no money. In fact, they'll have less money because they have a spare bedroom. Um, they uh, would also have a weight problem and they would like to lose weight. Um, they can't afford to eat any differently, but they would like to take more exercise, but they're not confident about how to start. So um, one particularly effective model of health trainers are people who apply health coaching um, skills, but um, health, co um, health trainers, um, it's support from next door rather than support from on high, working with someone just like you um, to give you the confidence to go out and join a local neighbor walking group. The third person comes in, why are people so different? It is a nuisance. Um, the third person comes in, pushed in the wheelchair, very short of breath, by their daughter. They've got terrible COPD. They're terrified about being at home, um, and uh, uh, they can't manage at all. Um, discussing it through, the things that might help might be some telecare um, to, to, to support them at home, um, referral to an integrated multidisciplinary team to help get a stair lift and assess their, their social needs. But what they really want is to get back to that community art group where they used to do go that builds their that is that gives that reduces their stress and builds their social capital. Now, from the commissioning perspective, what's needed is a portfolio of things that are geared to the local population, that they can commission on behalf of the local population, and gradually, by feedback um, and, and utilization, get this better and better. So that's one role uh, for the commissioners, but none of this will work unless that care planning consultation is appropriate and effectively carried out. And, and I think the message is that it's the care planning consultation, uh, consultation that is the gateway to providing individualized, tailored, and personalized services. And because it is so important, it needs to be done properly. This is not something that can just be relegated to untrained staff. This is critical. And I want to describe what high quality care planning could look like. Uh, I, the time doesn't allow for me to describe um, uh, or to tell you anything other than this has been developed by really rigorous testing in England, a large amount from the Year of Care programme, also from co-creating health programme and other programmes. What I'm going to describe to you is robustly cited. But I want to start with just clarifying language. Um, the translation from policy to practice has been um, bedeviled by um, muddled use of language. On this side, you have something that is effectively a treatment plan, but many professionals call that a care plan. That's what they do to and for people, and it's very, very useful. What we're talking about today is the discussion between a healthcare professional and the person with the long-term condition to find out what is and, and, and help them get their goals and actions for living their life uh, with the, in the situation that they find themselves in. We're talking about having better conversations. And those better conversations need to be systematic and structured. And for the medics in the room, that would not be a surprise because that's what, I'm a doctor, that's what we have in our heads all the time. 
the structure for a care planning consultation would include these sort of things, information gathering, information sharing, then agenda setting, some prioritization, but ending with goal setting. It's the person's own goal. It's the only own goal we like in England. Um, and action planning ending up with uh, recording an agreed and shared plan. But the thing that makes this different from a clinical um, consultation is not just the focus on the goal setting and the action planning, but it's what goes on up here to make this important. You cannot have a true meaning of experts in a conversation if they do not have the same information and they do not understand it to start with. And what we need in care planning is not just the professional story, that's the sort of stuff, the tests that are in the medical record, very important as it is. We need to put equal weight and value on the person's story, what it's like now to live uh, when your mother-in-law has arrived with dementia to stay with you. And it's pulling those things together um, and uh, the consultation cannot happen without proper presentation. And what those sites um, in the Year of Care program did was they worked out how to enable this whole thing to happen. Uh, they had a systematic approach, I'll use that word, endlessly. Um, and what they, um, the key thing they did was to separate, separate out all that information collecting and gathering from the time that people could spend doing those important things um, in, the, in the consultation. Uh, and it was having a first contact where tests um, could be performed, time then to reflect between them as they were sent out to the person before the consultation occurred that was important. But I guess you're saying, this is madness. You couldn't do this. You have 10 minutes. I actually have less than one minute, but you have um, 10 minutes. Um, um, your administrative staff couldn't possibly do this. They're grossly overworked um, already. Uh, and that's where um, the uh, model that you've already uh, seen from Ed came into its own. To protect the critical, central, important care planning consultation, you need to have um, to, to change the administration and the environment that we work in at the moment. Because, of course, you're right. All of those things you can't do at the moment. We have to change the world we work in. And you all have seen this before, the engaged, informed patient, working with the healthcare professional committed to partnership, the organizational processes to enable you to do that are the roof, and the commissioning is, the, the, the commissioning is the foundation. And this provides two things. It provides a metaphor, because you can't have a house with simply one wall if it's not fit for purpose. It has to have a sound roof and a foundation. All those things need to be there together. It's also a checklist. And as we go around and help local communities to build their house, they have all sorts of things that they come up with which are important for them um, for each of the components of the house. But the one that I want to concentrate on is the right wall, because that's what we're talking about today. And where healthcare professionals have a role both in leadership, in being part and supporting uh, partnership roles within integrated teams, but critically in developing the consultation skills and particularly the positive attitude that values the person that they are working with as someone who brings assets and uh, expertise of their own. And there are two lessons that we learned as we have put the house into practice that are important for today. The first one is that many people start, because it's the easiest way, with the practical things. Let's send out test results to patients so they have them. But we discovered that when that happens, without addressing professional attitudes and skills, then those things get ignored. People who have worked out and thought beforehand what to say things for the very first time and found they're put in the waste paper basket is a terrible outcome. On the other hand, when we sent people, sent people on, um, we provided training for people um, and professionals in a whole range of the things you've heard about this morning, but they then came back to their own clinics and practices, which were running just the same way as they had before. They couldn't put these into practice, and that was demoralizing. So basic training and support for this, we believe, is about addressing attitude, skills, and infrastructure altogether. 
And when that's done, professionals find that this is a better way to work. And they begin to demand those advanced skills that they now know that they need to support people. So people with long-term conditions are everywhere in the NHS. Uh, uh, most of them are down the bottom here um, in uh, primary care and in general practice, um, living their lives on an everyday basis. Most of the expensive ones here are in the traditional community services. But some of them, as we've already heard a bit about, are in um, hospital beds, and we want to prevent a readmission for them and a lot of seeing specialists in outpatient clinics. The house is appropriate in all those settings because it enables the um, discussion and the, 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 the development work um, with the person to go on in an environment in which it is likely to stick. And I've put here in the center Martin McShane's uh, phrase, person-centered integrated care. So in summary, people with long-term conditions need the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to thrive, Mar Margaret's lovely word. The NHS at the moment provides a fragmented patchwork of projects. Um, skills training for staff doesn't work without changes to attitudes, that's the culture, and infrastructure. And there is a delivery system that provides a starting point for local configuration, a unique solution tailored to each person, that prevent the potential to provide a template for workforce planning and an environment that will actually help health coaching to get to the right people at the right time, in the right way, so that health coaching can thrive. Thank you.